Hello humans, and welcome to the first ever episode of Bigfoot's Great American History Show. I'm your host, Bigfoot. This is my sidekick, the Jackalope. Ah. He's the Guillermo to my Jimmy Kimmel. Or for the boomers, that's the Ed McMahon to my Johnny Carson. Ah. Today's episode is all about Samuel Adams. Ah. No, not the beer. I'm talking about Samuel Adams' founding father leading member of the Sons of Liberty, and one of the first Americans to call for independence from the British. We've got the lowdown on the fiery lead-up to the American Revolution on this episode of Bigfoot's Great American History Show. Born September 27, 1722. As a student at Harvard, he was introduced to the works of the Enlightenment philosopher John Locke, who believed that all men were born with certain inalienable rights, and that government exists only by the consent of the governed. Sound familiar? Incidentally, it was also at Harvard that young Sam was fined for drinking prohibited liquors. But that's neither here nor there. Early in life, he inherited a malted barley business from his father. Unfortunately, his father left large debts along with the malt house. Yet, when creditors tried to have his estate sold to pay the debts, Sam threatened the sheriff and potential buyers and succeeded in scaring them off. Four times! By the late 1750s, his creditors had given up. So, while Adams may have been a failed maltster, clearly he was unusually gifted at defying authorities. He was later elected to the position of local tax collector, but he failed to collect what was owed or to keep proper accounts. As a result, his ledgers were off by thousands of pounds. Once again, he got away with it, likely because he had become a leading member of the Boston Caucus, an influential group of men in the city which elected officials and influenced legislation. Meanwhile, from 1756 to 1763, the British were busy fighting France and its allies in what's now known as the Seven Years' War. Incidentally, the war lasted nine years in North America, and if you grew up in my backyard, you probably know it as the French and Indian War. Fighting a war, of course, costs money, and in fighting the Seven Years' War, the British accumulated a large amount of debt. In order to raise revenue, they passed the Sugar Act in 1764, which actually cut the tax on molasses in half from what it had been under the Molasses Act of 1733. Alas, the jackalope, you cheer in vain. You see, the Molasses Act had never actually been enforced. With the new Sugar Act came a crackdown on the tax-free smuggling of molasses. And as molasses prices went up, New England's molasses-based rum industry began to suffer. <laughs> new Englanders protested loudly. And along with another political activist named James Otis, the loudest of the voices was that of, you guessed it, Samuel Adams. In a letter to the Massachusetts legislature, he wrote, If taxes are laid upon us in any shape without our having a legal representation where they are laid, are we not reduced from the character of free subjects to the miserable state of tributary slaves? In response to the growing complaints and subsequent American boycotts of British goods, Parliament passed another tax, the Stamp Act of 1765, which placed a tax on nearly all printed material in the colonies, including legal documents, newspapers, pamphlets, and even playing cards. I know, read the room, right? Thus, the conflict deepened, and no taxation without representation became a rallying cry of the colonists. As for Sam, the failed maltster became one of the most powerful figures of the growing colonial resistance. Through him, the Boston Caucus appears to have been absorbed into the infamous Sons of Liberty, which in Boston thrived under his leadership. By 1768, Parliament had repealed the Stamp Act and replaced it with the Townsend Acts, which placed new duties on glass, paint, paper, lead, and tea. In response, Adams and James Otis persuaded the Massachusetts House of Representatives to pass a statement known as the Circular Letter, which argued that the Townsend taxes were unconstitutional because the colonies were unrepresented in British Parliament. Representation in Parliament, of course, was essentially impossible due to a little thing called the Atlantic Ocean. By default, then, according to the Circular Letter, the only bodies that could levy taxes on the colonies were their own local assemblies. 
Needless to say, Parliament was not pleased when the circular letter began to, well, circulate. The British Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Hillsborough, ordered the Massachusetts General Court to revoke it. When the court refused, the royal governor retaliated by dissolving the Massachusetts Assembly. <sighs> Writing in newspapers under the name Determinus, Sam Adams did what he did best. He stoked the people's rage. Violence ensued. Mobs attacked customs officials, whereupon Britain sent four regiments of soldiers to Boston. When a group of these soldiers shot into a mob in 1770, Adams famously labeled it a massacre. Most of the Townsend Acts were eventually repealed due to the unrest. Parliament, however, was unwilling to admit that it lacked the authority to tax the colonies. To prove its point, the tax on tea remained. Parliament went on to pass the Tea Act in 1773, which granted the East India Company a monopoly on the tea trade in the colonies and served as a na 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 na, -na to the Sons of Liberty. Once again, Adams attacked through the press and rallied the troops. On December 16th, a group of men dressed as Native American warriors threw 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor in protest. Not at all coincidentally, the men had just attended a meeting led by one Samuel Adams. Suffice it to say then that he properly earned his reputation as a rabble rouser. On the eve of the revolution, when Massachusetts Royal Governor Thomas Gage sent British forces to Concord, Massachusetts to seize a cache of weapons, American intelligence was under the impression that the British were on their way to Lexington to arrest, along with John Hancock, Sam Adams. After all, that just made good sense. A year later, Adams was signing the Declaration of Independence at Independence Hall in Philadelphia and was among 13 men selected to draft the Articles of Confederation, which served as the first frame of government for the new nation. The rest, as you humans say, is history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification button to ensure you don't miss an episode. And if you've got any questions, comments, or other interesting tidbits about Samuel Adams you'd like to share, let us know in the comments below. Until next time, this is Bigfoot saying so long and save me a seat at your next campfire.